Okay, let's start. Okay, welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Peace to all of you. Um, here we are with our ninth class, if I'm not wrong, in the spring session of the Interfaith Explorations. Um, our topic is spiritual literacy in daily life, in which we are learning about speci uh, specific spiritual practices to deepen our relationship with ourselves, with our deep self, with the sacred around us, the world around us, and the people around us. The classes are sponsored by the Interfaith Center of Arkansas, the Cobb yeah. Institute, and Process and Faith. Interfaith Center of Arkansas is a nonprofit committed to reducing the fear and prejudice among world religions through education, dialogue, and relationship building. We are situated in central Arkansas, and we have Sandy right here with us, Sandy Watson, who's the administrator, and I am the executive director of the Interfaith Center. Cobb Institute is in California, and like the name, it's in the honor of John Cobb. Um, it's inspired by the knowledge that all life is interconnected and in the process of becoming, and they promote process and relational ways of understanding and living in this world. We, our teacher, Dr. J. McDaniel, serves on the board of Cobb Institute, actually is the board chair of Cobb Institute. And Process and Faith is a collaborative project of Cobb Institute and the Center of Process Studies. And they offer workshops and classes featuring faith leaders from all different traditions, sharing insights and uh, learning about what it means to be a whole person, a whole community, and how we might live and work together to protect this planet. We use spirituality and practice as a resource the website is developed by uh, Frederick and Marianne Brousset, and we use the tool of spiritual alphabet. And here we are uh, with Dr. Jay McDaniels, our teacher, our moderator, distinguished professor of religion, who has retired from Hendricks College, <clears throat> but he has um, honored us to be our teacher and help us understand how people live and think in different parts of worlds and how they are shaped by different religious point of views and and he's constantly shaping our point of views as well so today we are discussing h for hope and t for teachers and jay is it okay to start with h for hope i was going to start with t for teachers uh, i can start either way do you want to start with hope it's really okay either way no, let's just start with, if, if you're thinking about T for teachers, then let's uh, start with T for teachers. I was reading one of, I was going to read one of the quotes that I sent uh, to the class. So let's start with T you, for teachers. Why don't you do it? Let, let's, let's reverse that. Let's start with H for hope. And okay. you go with that. Yeah. Okay, let's start with um, H for hope then. And um, there is a season, which is a famous book by Joan Chitsier, she wrote in her book mm -hmm. about hope, which I actually sent it to all of you. And mm -hmm. she says that let us plant dates, even though those who plant them will never eat them. We must live by the love of what we will never see. Because such disciplined love is what have given prophets, revolutionaries, and saints the courage to die for the future that they envision. They make their own bodies the seed of their highest hope. And hope has intrigued me a lot, actually, because sometimes it feels that um, it's as important as faith and a lot more important than some of the spiritual practices we talked about, because sometimes I can live without beauty or joy or vision or attention, but it's really hard to live mm -hmm. without hope. And especially if the hope that tomorrow will be better than today is not there, mm -hmm. then it's very hard to actually even envision the next day of your life. So I feel that hope is a very, very powerful emotion for me to get up every morning because I am a social justice person. I want tomorrow to be better than today for the people that I'm serving. And if 
I believe tomorrow is not going to be better than today, then I can go on. So anyways, Jay, let's start with hope and see how everybody in the class feels about it. That's great, Sophia. Sophia, let me ask you a question uh, right there. When you hope that tomorrow will be better than today, do you um, hope that it will be permanently better? In other words, once it gets better, it will last in that betterness uh, or not? Well, for me, as I have um, evolved in my spirituality, life and change are synonymous. Mm -hmm. So if there is no change, um, it I mean, life means there is going to be change tomorrow, either worse or better, hopefully uh -huh. better. And if mm -hmm. there is no change, that means death. And by change, I mean not only outward change, also inward change. We should be changing and growing. So um, I don't know if it's going to be uh, better or worse, but we need to do something as agents, as, as agents of change and as caliphs of God on this planet, we need to be doing something. In my opinion, our lives should be action oriented. Mm -hmm. which means some change is going to happen. And sometimes in order to um, fulfill our vision, we have to go down before we even go up. Um, so it could be either way, Jay, for me personally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's take a look. And I'll, I'll tell you why I was asking that question in a moment. But let's take a look at what the Brussets say. And so I'll share the screen. Uh, if you can enable me, Sandy, and then I'll tell me when. Ready. All right. So let me see if I can find it. We'll see. Nope. That's not it. Nope. Here we go. So here's what the Brussets say. Um, hope is a positive and potent spiritual practice. Jay, Jay. I'm oh, sorry. can't see it? Can't see it. We need to back out of that one and and get a new one. Get the new one. Back out of the three. In churches. churches. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. All right. I'm going to try again. Tell you what, I'm not able to do this, so let me just talk. Uh, uh, for me, as as for many of us, hope is like oxygen, and we we need to breathe hope as a nourishment that keeps us going. And there maybe is a difference between hope and optimism. Optimism is the confidence that things will of necessity uh, be better. But I don't know that I think that. But I do think that things can be better. But we need to kind of... Um, be realistic and be honest uh, about whatever difficulties we face. So I myself would distinguish hope from optimism, and I want to say yes to hope, but be careful about optimism, too much optimism. It can be naive. But then I started thinking and I uh, about what kinds of hope, what's the content of hope, that people carry in their lives? What does it look like? And so I just want to name some different kinds of hope. And, and one is uh, 
personal hope. You know, I don't, I can't speak for the rest of the world, but I, I hope that I grow a little wiser and a little more compassionate as an individual in this life. And a second kind of hope is what uh, you might call social hope. I hope that, that we, as a community of people, that we, as a village, that we, as a city, that we, as a nation, that we, as human beings on a small but gorgeous planet, that we can improve that we can respond to global climate change, that we can grow more socially just, that we can become more compassionate. So that's social hope, and it can have various gradations. You know, my family, my city, my neighborhood, my village, my nation, the greater world. Both of those kinds of hope, the personal and the social, are examples of what you might call historical hope. And that means that their hope uh, for this world, on this earth, in a timeline. There's really a third kind of hope that a whole lot of people have carried in their hearts and has been very important to them. And I'll call it trans-historical hope. It's not, it, it's hope that despite death, despite disease, despite tragedy, there is something that's more than history that is a place of hope. Now, for some people, that place is, is heaven. Or if I'm Muslim, it's, it's paradise. And I, we just need to know, for some people, that, that hope, that for a trans-historical hope, has been extremely important. Not always for them, but for others. Because so many people die in incompleteness or in violence. And you hope that they may know a kind of peace in another world that they didn't know in this world. So are you all with me so far? So personal hope, social hope, both historical, a version of trans-historical hope. And, and I, I wanna give that, put that out there. And I'm gonna name a fourth one here. Uh, it's not as common, but um, the philosopher Whitehead talked about it and you also find it in, in Judaism. Um, in, in much of Judaism, there's not a great deal of emphasis on heaven or personal afterlife, most of Judaism. But there has been an, in, an interest in, may, may my deeds continue to have an effect uh, in this world, even as I pass away. May whatever good that I did have an effect even as I pass away. That's a kind of hope too. One last kind of hope and that, that'll be it. The philosopher Whitehead is kind of interesting because he himself wasn't sure there was life after death personally. He said it can be, it cannot be, I don't know. But he actually envisioned God as a receptacle for all that happens. And so he spoke of God as the deep memory 
And so everything that happens becomes is woven into God's life and continues in that way, even as, as it's neglect forgotten in this life. So you think about the well, most of most human beings are forgotten. Their individual lives, it, it's almost as if they didn't exist. And yet you can wonder if somehow their lives are carried as memories into something more. So, so many forms of hope, personal hope in this life, social hope in this life, trans-historical hope, hope for heaven, hope for paradise, and also just hope for something that I do continues to have a good effect even as I pass away. When you think about the role of hope in your life, how would you prioritize those? Or, I mean, do some seem much more important than the others? Are they all important? Or have I missed something completely? There's a kind of hope that I didn't touch. Uh, what do you think? Deb, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Let me ask you first, what was the name of that last philosopher that you talked about? Alfred North Whitehead. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm, I think that all of those types of hope and probably others that somebody else will think of, they're all valid aspects of hope, but I struggle with hope. Mm -hmm. It has to have a balance. Of course, I wake up in the morning and I hope I have a good my kids are okay. I hope all these things, but I also know that that doesn't mean anything because they might not. It might be a bad day. They might not wake up in the morning. I can't say that. And too many people, it seems to me, go on this optimistic hope and use that. Hey, Deb, to, Deb, yeah. just, just, you're, we're losing you ever so slightly. So just say the last thing you said a little, one more time. <laughs> okay. Too many people that I know base all of their actions primarily on hope. And they are so unrealistic in mm -hmm. what they do, in what their actions are. So, I, and their expectations, they have all these expectations because of hope. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm not too fond of hope. <laughs> I'm not depressed, I'm not, none of that. It just, it has a place, but it really can't be a major factor in anything that I think or do or anything. It's, it's an underlying quality. Mm -hmm. You know that we want to be. You know, I want to be this. I want to be that. But I can't stop and think about everything that I do. Mm. Okay, I think we got about three quarters of that, Deb, because you kind of come in and out. But I do think we got the gist of it, and I think it's it's actually wonderful to to call into question hope. You know, maybe so for you, but not for me. Um, and it can be very unrealistic. Now, would anybody like to respond to what Deb said or share a complimentary point of view? Steve. I, I don't know that this is in response to what Deb said, but when I think of hope, I think of hope as being unattached to circumstances. Mm. And, and it seems to me that I become more aware of hope and more aware of presence <clears throat> in the midst of my hopeless circumstances. And I think in a way, it's similar to what Sophia said just a little while ago, that we must go down before we go up. And I feel like with, with myself personally, because I'm a very detailed person, organized person. And it seems like unless my mind reaches a place of hopelessness, I don't think I really truly experience hope. And, um, you know, just recently a friend shared something with me that he was just pondering and it, the words were surrender to hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like such a negative thing. And yet, once again, I feel like I experience more awakening 
more presence, more hope in within my hopeless circumstances. And I just wanted to, to share that. Thank you, Steve. And Nita. Yeah. Um, hope's very important to me. And it's like you started out saying, it's like oxygen. And one of the ways that it, I differentiate uh, some of the things that maybe have been spoken about. Um, I, I really like the work of Anthony, Anthony DeMello, who was a priest. And he said, there's a big difference in expectation and expectancy. If you live in expectation, you're full of judgment and requirements and you'll always probably be disappointed. If, on the other hand, you live in the sense of expectancy of what might be, could be, what we're lured toward, as it were, uh, the best of God's hope for us, um, it's less, uh, it's it's so hopeful. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think I embrace all of those forms of hope that you talked about in one way or another. But it, and it's not that I haven't been to the bottom dregs of things in life. We've had some really hard things happen in our lives. But always uh, hope sustains me in and, and a deeply spiritual level. And, um, and I think it's because I live not in a false optimism, but in a, in a deep spiritual expectancy that there can be more. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nita. Thank you. Bill, Mary Beth, then, and then Carla. Yes. Um... When Steve was talking about uh, hopelessness, what seems to help me is if I'm um, authentic enough to recognize maybe sort of a chaotic, it's, it's not exactly hopelessness, but um, where there's no possibility of expectancy because I don't know what I'm expecting you know, um, anticipating or anything, but if there's some despair in that, if I can be authentic and vulnerable in relationship, then it's like things clear up. I can, I can see the future. I can, you know, like you say, you don't, you can't demand that certain things are going to happen, but you can take the next step and participate um, in um, that vital life force that we get to share. And so I just thought I'd throw that out. Thank you. Yeah. There are a lot of threads uh, in, in what we're saying now. Let, let's see if we can weave them together in a moment. Um, and that, that includes yours right there, Carla and then Greg. So I like what what's being said about expectancy. Um, I don't necessarily get up in the morning and say, I hope this is going to happen. I hope that's going to happen. But I have had several experiences here just over the last few weeks. Um, I went to a couple of um, our colleges, their museums that have the senior art students mm -hmm. And as I went through and I looked and I read, I left both those museums with hope. Mm -hmm. Hope of, of what a younger generation is seeing and talking about and expressing. <clears throat> and again, yesterday, I went to the uh, recently renovated Arkansas mm -hmm. Museum and there was a elementary class that came in and you could have gotten very upset with them because of their exuberance, <laughs> but the, you could just see the wonder and the hope in those children as they walk through and they see these, this artwork. And they told me that they had been studying this in school and you could just see the hope in their eyes that there is something more out there. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's things that I can just kind of run into that mm. um, can be a blessing to me. 
Mm -hmm. Thanks, Carla. Thank you, Greg. Uh, yeah, I'm still uh, still kind of stuck at the beginning with Sophia's statement that hope is a spiritual practice right up there with faith. And I don't know if I misquoted or because that just knocked me away when I heard it. And it makes me think that uh, I wonder if in our various uh, various faiths where we have something called discipleship, uh, which is, you know, often how do we make ourselves better participants in the faith and, and deeper believers, et cetera. What if you, I wonder if you frame discipleship as a deepening of the capacity to hope. And that, to me, that, that would change a lot of the things that we would do because we are essentially in, you know, at the core of a faith practice, for me anyway, is hope. So anyway, just a, just a thought. Sophia, you want to respond to, to what Greg said or what anybody said? Um, would you explain that to me in the end, what Greg said about discipleship? Let me, Sophia, let me try to put it this way. Take um, the Medina congregation. And, and perhaps one of the purposes, one of the things that happens when they're together, literally together, but also a sense of togetherness even when they're apart, is that that togetherness can elicit in them, ignite in them, a sense of hope. And the hope surfaces in the hearts of each, but it is through community. It is through a shared practice, a shared aspiration to, to be faithful to Islam as they understand it and to one another. And hope surfaces from that. I think, Greg, that's what I took your, your point to be. And it, does that ring true, Sophia? Does that ring true? This is so interesting. I, we didn't. Um, this is a new pro, uh, point that you brought, but it's so true. There is a communal hope, and mm -hmm. that is why we create those spaces because we believe in something. We have a vision. So actually, let me take a step back. For me, so I always send quotes of what speaks to me most. So one of the quote that I sent today on hope was that. Hope is more than a verb. It's a noun, actually. It's it's an action. It's not a stance. It's a movement. So personally speaking, that's what hope is for me. It has different hope has different elements. There has to be a vision, a vision which of tomorrow, which is different from today. Whether I'll be a better person, whether I will be a more compassionate person, or a, I learn how to forgive better, or maybe the world will look better there will be less hunger or famine or something, but there has to be a vision for me personally. And then after that, I also have to have some agency to work towards that vision. So for me, hope is very action oriented. Uh, and that's why I send that quote that it's a verb, it's not a noun. And then my agency will help me work towards that vision. And that is hope. And that's why I connected it with faith for me. But I love what you just said, Greg, because um, sometimes we, and that's what leaders have done. That's what actually prophets and revolutionaries and saints have done. We need to create a community around us to instill that hope in everyone to make that vision a reality. So I love what you said, and I definitely um, connect with that, the communal hope, if I may call it. It's beautiful. Uh, I, I want to include within, as we leave this subject, the wisdom of Deb and also uh, Steve. And, and put in a word for, for doubt and suspicion of hope when it um, anesthetizes us to reality, you know, um, hope can be a, 
an opiate that anesthetizes us. And I don't think any of us want that to be, but I think part of Deb's insight was, you know, it can kind of, it can be an opiate. And Steve's insight that hope um, often comes out of despair. Out of despair. And a part of the, the Christian teaching that I grew up with and still believe certainly is that resurrection comes from death. It doesn't bypass death. Uh, and, and so there has to be a kind of dying of something for new life to emerge. And if you try to get around that dying, the new life can't emerge. It only, it's like a, it has to emerge out of something has to be let go of. Something has to, 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 to die. So I just want to put in a nod for, for Deb's healthy uh, skepticism and, and for Steve's recognition that hope and despair are not always opposites to one another. They, they can, this, from despair emerges hope. A last word um, just about, about God. Um, as a process theologian, and that's what I am, I think of God as, um, among other things, a source of fresh possibilities. Not as controlling things, not as making things happen, not as a puppeteer, not as a dominator, not even able to dominate, but as a source of fresh possibilities, no matter what happens. And so what that means is that faith is trust in the availability of fresh possibilities. Faith is, is trust in the availability of fresh possibilities. And if you think that way, faith and hope pretty, are pretty closely aligned. Pretty hard to distinguish. They come together. With that, shall we turn to teachers? Uh, last, if, if anybody has a last word on hope, go for it. And then we'll make that transition. Anybody want to say anything that hasn't been able to say? Ellen, go ahead. I do. I want to say as a teacher, and I think that I don't know everyone on here, but from what I've heard, everyone on here is a teacher or of some kind. That to me is ties together hope and uh -huh. teaching. I I find it very difficult. I keep saying that I'm retired, but I have a very hard <laughs> time actually retiring because I feel like I need to be connected to mm -hmm. kids and to mm -hmm. well, young adults also, because mm -hmm. that is, to me, that is the hope of what it is that I'm trying to convey or what I feel needs to be conveyed with regard to Jewish education and to how to maintain mm -hmm. our faith and our, um, or how to build on on the foundation of, of what Judaism is. <laughs> on what we want, yeah. what I want to convey. And so I find those two very interconnected. Yeah. Um, Ellen, speaking, um, in, in my view, Judaism is the source of, of hope. In other words, to, to what I mean is the idea that no matter what tragedies befall us, whatever exiles we face, whatever temples are destroyed, we as a Jewish people feel beckoned by something that, that is hope-giving, even if not in complete control. And that when I say that, I kind of think, in my mind, that's a, at the heart of Judaism part of the heart of Judaism. I don't know if you do. I agree with that. I don't know if you know that the, the word Hatikva, which is the national anthem of Israel, is the hope, translates as the hope. <laughs> and so that what you're saying is that I don't know that Jews could have survived all this time in all the different historical 
efforts to destroy yeah. a group of people if Sorry. there was not the hope of something better on the other side. Yeah. Faith in God that God will bring us through, but not everybody had, if you're sitting in a concentration camp worrying about if next hour you're going to be dead or not, you're not necessarily thinking that God is going to protect you. But mm -hmm. I think that the idea that there's hope, we I'm going to breathe one more breath, I'm going to live another hour mm. if possible, because I'm hopeful that there's going to be a, a positive resolution to this. Mm. Um, that's what kept people throughout history. That's what's been keeping people going actually. Mm. And also the teaching, you know, there was teaching done in all these different historical situations. There was teaching done so that people risked their lives in order to teach kids in the concentration camp what to do on Hanukkah or what to do on Passover or those kinds of things in the hope that I may not survive another day or hour, but you will survive another day or hour. So we want you to be hopeful in, in, in this experience. Well, that, and that sense of community too. Um, uh, Jesus was Jewish and the, the only prayer that he taught that we have record of doesn't begin my father who art in heaven it begins our father who art in heaven. Huh. And so he naturally and instinctively thought in community terms, not hyper individualistic terms. Mm -hmm. uh, I may not survive, but something about us can survive. Yes, correct. Yeah. And I think well, Jesus, I don't know that much about Jesus and Christian in uh, history, I admit, but I think that he, um, he he uh what do i want to say embodied well he his philosophy was jewish philosophy oh it was right? yeah with the bent i mean not exactly <laughs> he had his own individual take on that but still i think that that's why we say we were from the same foundation because of because of that and then it was <laughs> changed as the years went on but i think if you go back to the beginning People in that time addressed him in many ways, but one way they addressed him was rabbi. Rabbi, yes, right, I know. Uh, rabbi, it's it's just there. He so, was the first before rabbi, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's just me. I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> I haven't talked to Gene Levy about that, but that's what I think. <laughs> Okay, Let, let's turn to T for teacher now. Here we go. Oh, I, let's just look at what the Brussels say and then I'll, I'll see if I can do that again. Let's see if I get the wrong page too many times. Nope, that's not it. I'll just speak forth. Um, when, when I first thought about laying the stage for teachers for us, I'm a, I'm a teacher. We have probably have a lot of educators here. But I, at first I found myself, let's name the kinds of things that can be teachers for us. It's just interesting to think about. And of course we think of, of people. Um, we think of parents, rabbis, imams, friends spiritual directors, strangers, including strangers in airports, where you have a casual conversation and all of a sudden that person says something and you think, oh, you see something. So of course people can be teachers. Most of us come from a tradition that says books can be teachers. Uh, if we're Muslim, it's the Quran. If we're Jewish, it's Torah. If it's Christianity, it's the New Testament and the Hebrew Bible combined. We're the book-based traditions. Other traditions have books, but they have really been lifted up in those three traditions as really important. But then you remember that our books in the beginning were spoken, not written. And that the texts we have 
the script on pages at first existed through word of mouth, through speech. And oral speech has a quality of its own. We hear tones of voices. We hear all kinds of things in oral speech that we don't necessarily hear in written text. And most of religions in the world began with oral, uh, stayed with orality. Native American traditions don't have books. They have stories you tell. Same for African traditions. Same for indigenous traditions around the world. So oral speech is a source of teaching. Written text is a source of teaching. And then you think quickly about the natural world. Anybody have a pet that they love? Anybody have a dog or a cat? Has not that companion animal been a teacher for you? Anybody have a sacred place that you love? A field, a forest, an ocean side um, that you go to? Is not that place, is not that landscape, is not that element, be it ocean, water, whatever, is that not a teacher for you? And then there are historical, there are circumstances. Anybody suffer from a disease? Anybody who have friends who suffer from diseases? Anybody been through a hardship? You don't wish it happened. But does not that too become a teacher for you? Even the most horrible of things, do not they too become teachers? And then you think of music and art. Has anybody learned a thing or two? Uh, I'll plead very guilty here. Has anybody learned a thing or two from a pop song? So Sophia loves uh, John Lennon's Imagine. I do too. Is that not a teacher? Now, I won't, I'll speak only for myself. I'm also a fan of Freddie Mercury, of Queen, and his dynamic, outrageous, flamboyant presentation, besides his voice and the music itself. Is that not a teacher? And then you think of, of buildings and architecture. You've been into Medina Mosque. You've seen the beauty. You've seen the, the, the space where people pray. You see the Qibla. You see the architecture. You go into Temple B'nai Israel. You, you've, you see the place. You see the way it's structured. You go into a, a small church. You go into a cathedral. Are they not teachers? So I just want to remind us of how many things are teachers. It's kind of hard to find something that's not. However, think also about, uh, back to human beings, think of a person who's had a profound effect on your life. And every time you have a thought, you think, I wonder what, I wonder what she would think. I wonder what he would think. Because you respect their point of view. Now, Bill and Mary Beth are here, and they know John Cobb. Um, he's my teacher. I often wonder. How would this look to John Cobb? And sometimes I agree with him and sometimes I don't. But his view counts. He's a frame of reference. So over to you. What are some of your favorite teachers? Would someone share, get us started? Ellen, you're a teacher. Who taught you? 
I still remember Miss Ronahan, who was my sixth grade teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a woman who taught sixth grade in spike heels every day. And there were 43 of us in a classroom and she always maintained her composure. So she was my teacher as how to be in a classroom and how to be a teacher. Um, and I think that, but if you, if you expand, you know, my parents are, were my teachers. Um, I, I often think what would my father say, you know, if I say something or think about something or try to negotiate for a new car, what would my father say? Cause he was, not that he was such a savvy negotiator, but you know, you take your father when you buy your cars. Um, so there's that. And, uh, but I think that um, every new experience is a teacher. I think that you're dead if you're not learning something from whatever experience is happening. When I look out the window in the morning and I see woodpeckers or birds that I've never seen before, and I don't really know anything about birds. And so I'm always looking them up to see if I can find a picture of what this is. I think just waking up and being aware of what's around is is the teacher. Well, that's that's a take home point, Ellen. Every new experience as a teacher. Yes. All right. End of class. Let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to share the just the role of, of something or someone that has functioned for you as a really important teacher? By the way, Ellen, who was your, who was Mrs. What was her name again? Your Miss Ronahan was an Irish woman teaching in a school that was predominantly Jew. It was a public school, but I in Philadelphia there were pockets of Jewish and Irish and Italian people, so I happened to be in the Jewish area. So here was Miss Ronahan, the Irish teacher, in a school in a classroom where there were five people who were not Jewish. Everybody else was Jewish, and we learned to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, and we learned to do <laughs> Irish dancing, and we learned to do all these wonderful things, which I would never have done before. So <laughs> Miss Ronahan had it for me. Well, I just want to give everybody permission to find your own inner Miss Ronahan. <laughs> I bet we all have a Miss Ronahan in our lives that's worth remembering and lifting up and naming. Greg, you go first and then Lynn. Yeah, this this is a slightly different uh, direction, but I find the practice of my writing down what mm. is in my head is a very much a teaching moment because I make connections. I understand things. I pull my emotions away sometimes or I add emotions, but I am a much, much better person, much mm. better person to be around when I have the chance to mm. integrate. And for me, writing is my integration. That's so interesting, Greg, um, that a process, an activity can be a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lynn. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I wasn't thinking about it, but I'll say journaling in the past has been a tremendous help for me at different times, especially in the most difficult times. Uh, but what I was actually going to do was embarrass you, Jay, and say, um, I, you know, I was like two years from hospitalization mm -hmm. at St. Jude when I started at Hendrix. And I went a couple of years and realized this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. So I got out for a year, worked and traveled and came back, thought I was going into psychology and then realized that's not the fit either. And then I found um, you and the Rainy Building um, at a pivotal time really was an important um, teacher. So, so Jay, you already knew it, but just to embarrass you some more. Yeah, you're, you're right there. Not the only one by any means, but you're right there. Lynn, thank you. And, uh, you're a teacher for me too. It's um, teacher. All of us teachers know that our students are our teachers. Mm -hmm. And you were, but not just in general. You, Lynn Deloney, well, were a teacher for thank me. Thank you. And and I like the welcoming of every moment being potentially a teacher. So yeah, we are. Well, I belong to the religion of Ellen. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm following that one. Um, okay. Anybody else want to lift up and identify a, an important teacher in your life? Well, I will um, definitely follow up on Len and say that, Jay, you have been one of my very important teachers, actually, and maybe you don't know, but you 
years ago when we also met for Simon Rainey building, you would actually put me out of my comfort zone by posing questions which would shatter my concept of structured religion and <laughs> force me to think into ways which I didn't want to think at that time. So you have been one of the very important teachers in my life. And I also want to put one more thing out there. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we learn from very unexpected teachers. I don't know what to call it. Maybe an experience. And uh, I would rely on this quote by Khalil Gibran, who said, because it speaks a lot to me. He said that I learned silence from the talkative mm -hmm. and toleration from um, the intolerant mm -hmm. and kindness from the unkind. Mm -hmm. And that has worked for me a lot. Like, for example, reverence is a big quality for me, a spiritual practice for me especially showing reverence to the elders in our life. And guess who I learned it from most? The people who are most disrespectful. When I see something like that, I'm, like, I'm repulsed so much. And I'm like, no, I never, ever want to do it again. So there are experiences in my life in which I have learned the ethical value from people who are actually not practicing it. And they become my biggest teachers. And I really want to give them credit for that. Yeah, you know, uh, the Dalai Lama was once asked, who's your greatest teacher? And he said, Chairman Mao, because he taught me uh, the art of forgiveness. And just, just interesting. Deb and Bill or Mary, Mary Deb, Deb first. I was just going to say what, Aunt, what Sophia said, that I've learned many, many things from people who were actually not good people in my life or who did me harm or did harm to others. And if you can look dispassionately and lovingly at them, you can learn a lot. Mm, mm, mm. Thanks, Deb. Mary Beth. You're muted, Mary Beth. What everyone is sharing reminds me um, uh, at, at, on occasion, I uh, try to learn from when Jesus said that if you think you would not have persecuted the prophets, then for sure you would have mm. pers persecuted the prophets. And um, on occasion, I will ask myself, as I'm kind of judging people, mm -hmm. is that if I think I wouldn't do that, then probably for sure I will at some point. I mean, it's just a way to refine our hearts, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Greg, thanks for coming and we appreciate it so much. I think it just left. All right, anybody else want to lift up a teacher, Nita? Uh, yeah, uh, for me, I mean, all of these things just I resonate with, but... Uh, I really uh, also want to lift up the fact that uh, nature, music, mm -hmm. and the arts are huge teachers for me. And uh, th there's not only solace there, but just so many yeah. lessons, just so many things. Uh, I can walk along and see a flower, and it, all of a sudden, there's a whole, a whole lesson for me right there in the in the petals. So those are huge teachers for me. Nita uh, writes for my uh, website, and yesterday she wrote an article on seeing um, an old fence post, or I, I, we published one, an old discarded fence post in a field. And you used a phrase, you called it an unexpected beauty. That was exactly your phrase. And I thought that was a really beautiful phrase. Unexpected beauty as a teacher. All right. Um, anybody else on a teacher? We haven't had any pets yet. Surely someone has a dog or a cat. They just want to lift up a name. I'll just say that my Juno, who is no longer <laughs> walking this earth, was the most loyal dog a, an american eskimo dog the most law and to a fault actually but i won't go mm -hmm. there because he's dead but the um 
the most loyal, whatever I did, wherever I went, whatever I forgot to walk him, whatever it was, he was so forgiving, which really, you know, I think you learn a lot from dogs and cats um, in that way. So, so that's my dog thing. But before we hang up, I need to say how you and Sophia have been teachers for me with regard to opening my horizons and understanding and wanting to know more about interfaith work. So I, I really, really appreciate Miss Ronahan was in my past when I was 12 and 11. And now that I'm a bit older than that, I think that you and Sophia are very significant teachers in my life. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ellen. Um, thank you so much. Now, Sophia, Sophia will never accept the title teacher, but we know she is one. We just can't say that out loud, I think. But I'm I'm with you, Ellen. She's been a blessing to me and has been and, and will be. Sophia, you can bring us to a close today, if you will. Well, before leaving, I do want to say that we should also take a moment to uh, change the angle from teaching to learning before we mm -hmm. go. Because everything in life is a teacher, everything. It depends how eager and ready and open we are and our hearts are and our soul is to take that teaching in. Uh, so please take it with you as you go, um, because if we get to that spiritual state in which we are willing to learn mm -hmm. from everything around us, where everything around us becomes sacred, then everything will become our teacher. So let me leave you with this quote, which I already sent you in the email, but let me leave it with you and let's try to practice in, the, in this coming week. So uh, I sent you that um, everything in life is a teacher with a lesson that is perfectly made for you during the moment in which it is received. In this very moment, the universe is whispering to you. There are messages for you carried on the winds, on the clouds, in the stars, in the day, in the night. There is wisdom for you in the morning songs of the birds, in the pink of the flowers, outside your window, in the soft murmur of the ebbing sea and the gushing stream. Even ordinary, everyday ordinary events in your life carry communications from the realm of the spirit. Open your heart, receive them, let them be your teachers. And with that, peace, salam, and shalom. I'll see you all next Wednesday. <laughs>